Welcome back everybody to the Denver Broncos franchise on Madden 20. We are now eight seasons into this series and we are now coming off our third consecutive Super Bowl title. The first five years of this series were pretty tough and there were a lot of bad seasons for us. But we have now become a dynasty here in Madden. We have won three consecutive Super Bowl championships. And now we are going to look back on this latest season, but we're really going to spend most of this episode talking about the future of the series because I still want to make content in this game and I really enjoy the franchise. Now obviously, after you win three Super Bowl titles in a row, there's not a whole lot left for you to accomplish. I think for me right now, it's just I enjoy playing games in this franchise and there's a never-ending cycle of stories involving all the players on our team and in the league. So, my focus right now is to set the series up so that it's still interesting for upcoming years, even after we've accomplished so much. I'll share with you today what I'll be doing for the future of this series and how I'm going to make it more realistic and more challenging. And I'll do that right after I do the recap. And normally I have to talk about all the turns during a season, all the changes. Well, this year it really had two defining chapters. The tough, inconsistent start. We go 2-0 and and then lose three in a row. We're kind of worried here, like, what's up with this team? And then we just never lose again the rest of the year and we constantly hold teams under 20 points and win a lot of these games fairly easily. The defense was as good as it's ever been. One of the best defenses I've ever constructed. And I'm quite impressed with it, especially knowing that I'm on some pretty tough sliders, I believe, and we've had some tougher years on this set and similar sets with previous teams. We just have a ridiculous defense, and nobody can really match up with them. The defense that we've constructed in this series is really special, and there hasn't really been a weakness on this defense for a long time. I think that uh, that's one of the reasons why the games have been so easy, especially over the last season, is this defense is like a Pro Bowl defense. And it really shouldn't fit together with the salary cap when you think about what these players should be getting. And that's going to be a big part of how I balance out the rest of this series. Overall, the offense also ranked very well this year because of how much we did on the ground. We were the number one team in running the football. We had some explosive games from Dion Price and Donovan Jennings and pretty much always had positive game scripts to be running the football. We weren't a great passing team, but we also didn't need to be. We scored a lot of points this year, third most in the NFL. We scored 40 offensive touchdowns, which really isn't very much, but it was plenty for us. Defensively, we ranked first in most major categories, including yardage allowed, we were third in passing, and first against the run as we tend to be in this series. We were first in points by a wide margin, but nowhere near the NFL record even in a 16 game season. The 2000 Ravens were pretty special, and in that season they only allowed 165 points. So. There's still a massive difference between what we allowed and what that Super Bowl winning team allowed back in 2000, which was actually the team that won the first Super Bowl I paid attention to. That was pretty fun to follow, even though I really didn't understand anything. But quarterback sacks first in that category as well, 64. We all know why we finished first place. That'd be Boogie Turner. And he's also a reason why we finished so high in fumble recoveries. That didn't take long to start. He had like three forced fumbles in the season opener. For third downs, we actually did improve here slightly. 7 of 11 on fourth down, 1 for 3 on two-point conversions in the red zone. Not bad here, 32 touchdowns and 57 trips. And then defensively, we allowed just 13 red zone touchdowns all season. When teams are constantly kicking field goals, they're not really chipping away at our leads very quickly. For turnover differential, we were not last actually because we had so many takeaways. First in giveaways, 
first in takeaways, minus one turnover differential, but 26 giveaways is a really big problem. And of course, I thought I had a plan in place for this year that would allow us to limit sacks and turnovers. Well, 16 picks, 66 sacks. That didn't exactly work out. And it's not like we're actually completing a ton of deep passes or anything. I'm just taking a lot of bad sacks and don't always have a good quick game. And I have some thoughts on how to fix that for next year, but obviously did not have a great year with Nate Sheffield. I think that he has a lot of strengths as a quarterback that I'm not utilizing all that well, and I need to do a better job of calling the passing game. Taking four sacks a game is not something that we should be doing, especially when we're not even passing the football all that much relative to some other teams. So we're passing 472 divided by 16 is only 29 and a half, and we're still getting sacked so many times. So if you include scrambles and everything here, Sheffield has 29 runs. Let's say each one was a scramble. There might have been a couple that weren't or something. Maybe I call the read option. I don't think I did, but plus 472, plus 66, that's 567 dropbacks, which means he's getting sacked on 11.6% of dropbacks, which is terrible. I've had this constant eight season battle with the quick passing game here in Madden, and overall I've talked about how I don't like the quick passing game because a lot of timing routes mess with accuracy. I'm sure you've seen many bad throws on slants and just quick hitting passes that go wide of the target and often get intercepted. And it takes so long for players to make a catch, gather their momentum, and move up field. So it's difficult to get yards after the catch, and you really need great yards after the catch players to do much after they make that catch. So that's another thing that will affect what we do going forward. But my goal was to make the running game the focal point of the offense, and that was a success. Now, Donovan Jennings ended up with worse stats than Deion Price, but I would say for the first three quarters of the season, Jennings was the better running back. He was more explosive, he was averaging many more yards per carry, but Deion Price ended up having a huge close to the season before he got injured, and that vaulted all of his stats forward in a major way. So we had the 202 yard performance, the 193 yard performance. If I'm not mistaken, those were like back to back games too. So with 70 yard runs, that will skew the averages a little bit. Overall, they were both great. Having this duo together is awesome, and I hope that we can keep it together. Now, Injuries did become a part of the season again for these two. Donovan Jennings, after playing all 16 in year four, ended up missing some time this year, had to return in the postseason. So he played 13 games, second most in his career. Overall, I like how I managed the carries there to make sure that they would stay healthy as much as possible. And they're just a terrific tandem, over 2,200 yards combined, 17 touchdowns, both have big playability. I do overall have to give the edge to Deion Price because in some games, the Super Bowl for instance, like Jennings can get bottled up by good run defenses. But Price and his quickness, it's just something that changes the game dramatically. Those first few steps, him covering more ground, being able to take angles that Jennings can't, everything there. That's why I was using him so much in the short running game, because I trusted the blocking, and I knew that if he wasn't hit in the backfield, he was gonna get a yard if he needed to. He didn't have to break a tackle to do it, he's just fast enough to run behind a good line and get a yard when you need him to. So I'd love to know the stats on how that converted, but, I think it did a really good job. Jennings still very good, love him in the red zone, and he also uh, got a little more involved in the passing game at times, 10 catches this year. Then uh, Cameron Britt got to fill in a little, developing him as an undrafted running back, you know I enjoy that, 3.3 yards per carry. Courtney Jean-Charles, 
Now, he got hurt very early on in the season, so he didn't develop this huge role, but I started to expand it as the season progressed and we got to the playoffs. And I tried to call some shot plays for him. They don't always have, uh, you know, an opening to take the shot, but he's a fun player to utilize, whether it's a read option or you're trying to get him outside the pocket to make a big throw. And right now, I'm not leaning towards trading him. I still like to keep him around because he does give us some plays we can call that we're just not going to with Sheffield. And I don't want to replace that role. If I traded Jean Charles, I'd just be trying to find somebody else to do exactly what he does. Tyrone Houston got some jet sweeps this year. He was kind of the gadget receiver and receiver in general was an interesting situation this year because of how many players there were and then the shift of Corville being the number one to Vashon Wright becoming the top receiver in yards, in catches. Touchdowns were a little bit different. I have no clue why Payne ended up with four touchdowns and Corville and Wright only had five combined. Summers in the red zone, I mean, I just... I know how to use tight ends in the red zone effectively, I know how to get them open, and the mismatches are a little easier to take advantage of. So I call a ton of plays that are designed to get Summers the ball in the red zone. But um, overall, I like Terrell Corville, but as the season went on, and really, when we played the Rams, and I saw Dallas Levine play against us, that's when it hit me like, that's the type of player we need. A yards after the catch type of player who makes plays underneath and can make extra yards happen. Corville isn't that receiver and we're not a great deep passing team. It's hard to be a deep passing team against this pass rush. So I intend to trade Terrell Corville in the offseason. His production has dropped off the last couple of years. He's not any worse at being a deep threat. He just doesn't fit the offense and the deep threat role on our team is not one that we should probably be spending $13 million in cap space on. His release, his ability to get off the line is unmatched, but we still aren't getting the production, and I think that we have to look in a different direction at receiver. While we continue to play Vashon Wright, who is on his rookie campaign, he plays the slot well, he makes tough catches, but between him and Corville, neither one gives you really anything after the catch. In the underneath game, I'm not really able to extend plays with Wright and Corville, and I want a receiver that can do that. Justin Payne had a little more yards after the catch, 32 catches. Dion Price utilized a little bit in the passing game, probably should be more than this. Tyrone Houston, he is going to be an interesting player this offseason because his ratings are good, his development is good, but I've never played with him and really felt like he played like a dominant receiver. But the ratings suggest that he has that ability. So do you sign him without seeing that ability for a long time? Or do we let him go? Because these ratings look really, really impressive. Outside of not really having the elusiveness. Which isn't a huge problem, but it's something I'm looking for. We have some tough decisions to make this year at receiver, but the main thing that I do want to try doing is trading Terrell Corville and then looking for another receiver to fill that role. For the offensive line, I felt like they played pretty well. I took a lot of bad sacks. Matt Killhouse allowed 11. This is probably his last year starting, but it's been a seven year run. He's regressing now, normal development, so we'll probably look to move on and maybe play Cameron Vaughn a year from now if we can't find a more impactful upgrade. I believe Hillhouse is also going to be a free agent this year. I like the addition a lot of Nick Lloyd. Norman Proctor is playing way better than he did earlier in his career, and Zach Martin was a big addition to the offensive line. While Lindsey Muldrow just continues to, I feel, outplay his ratings and be pretty solid, especially in the running game. He's always getting into the second level and throwing key blocks that allow us to extend runs. Going to the defense now. This is just unbelievable, the talent we have here. I believe we have a couple different franchise cornerstone defensive players. Boogie Turner, of course, after a 23-sack season. 
and then you consider what we've done with Eric Palmer over the last couple of years in his development two dominant pass rushers to go with a unique linebacker that is irreplaceable Jamari Akinjide to me is a major X factor for this defense he is obviously very good at racking up tackles he had 172 this year after 160 a year ago his coverage is very solid and forces a lot of passes to go away from him so he helps take away that middle of the field that usually is a problem for a lot of defenses but teams have to attack us elsewhere we still have miles jack perhaps maybe not making the same impact as akinjide now but still very good eric mckinney jt granger damian charles i think that if any of those three was your best corner you're in a fine position we have all three of them and then i mean at safety xavier watts Darnell Savage, there are no holes on the defense. There are nine starters, I believe, that have Pro Bowl ability. Bradley Chubb had a dominant Super Bowl. He might not make as many plays as he did earlier in his career, but he's still really good. And we've been able to keep this defense together because... The salary cap hasn't become enough of an issue, and I did avoid that a little when I decided that we were going to move on from Taekwon Layton and not really have to worry about breaking up the defense and what we had that was working. So that is part of it. Obviously teams do this now. When you have a quarterback on a rookie contract, you can approach building your team very differently, and we certainly have. But I still think it's taken to an extreme where we have so many players that should probably be paid more than they are. But a combination of the contract demands in Madden and the XP sliders have led to an easier path to keeping the team together. For instance, I was able to sign Xavier Watts a couple years ago to a new deal that saw him get paid as an average safety and I don't think he's an average safety he's exceptional in coverage and he should be probably paid double this and there are a lot of situations like that now what I think we need to do going forward and I've thought about a lot of opportunities here we could go to a new team start over that would be interesting but we have a journey with these players and ending that to go start with a different team I don't know if I want to go that route and I don't intend to anytime soon. So what I'm going to be doing now this off season is I'm going to be doing some contract reworking and some rating rebalance. The rating rebalance is going to be for other teams in the league. I'm not messing with any ratings on our team, but I will mess with their contracts. Ultimately, the game does not enforce enough difficulty on its own. So I am going to be redoing some of the biggest contracts on our team and I want some feedback on what you think I should do exactly. I know that I'm going to increase Boogie Turner's contract. I just don't know what the number is going to be. But let's go through a real scenario here. I mean Boogie Turner compares very much to Aaron Donald. Same sort of impact, same caliber player, very different contracts. So if you were to pull up like Aaron Donald's page on over the cap, they have a percentage of the cap allotted to their cap number there. So Aaron Donald on his contract in 2020 accounts for 12.2% of the Rams salary cap. I'll skip 2021 because they're going to have a drop off in the cap number. So it's not going to be a typical year and 2020 at least gives us a 100 the uh cap number this year was 198.2 ours meanwhile is sitting around 230 in 2026 here in game so this year aaron donald accounted for the rams cap 12.2 percent while boogie turner only accounted for seven percent that means that in terms of the cap, we paid 42% less to have Boogie Turner this year than the Rams did to have Aaron Donald. Now, he's in a different year of his career, obviously, a year of his contract. 
So it's not always going to be exact, but I think that we at least need to get to a point where Boogie Turner is accounting for 10 to 12% of our cap space. And part of this, keep in mind, like we signed Boogie Turner, I think at 92 or 93 overall. And the higher the overall, the higher the contract demand. Boogie Turner really should be a 99 overall player. So I want to give him a 99 overall contract to make things more realistic. I will be doing that for Turner's contract. I will be boosting the contract as well for Xavier Watts because this is ridiculously cheap. And maybe a couple others. If you have some feedback, you can let me know. Maybe Eric McKinney. He's been playing like a superstar the last season and a half. I really like this uh, series and I want to see it continue. And I think that we've got to make things a bit more realistic here so that the challenge remains. I don't think the sliders have to be altered. You can always change them to force a result. But in terms of the game playing balanced, I think all you're seeing is that we are that much better than other teams. And part of it is our defense has been able to stick together and the XP sliders haven't allowed for enough growth throughout the league. And one thing I really changed this year especially is I adjusted the XP sliders. I have been messing with them, but this year I decided I was going to significantly boost all the positions past where I had them before and just see what happens because one year at boosted XP isn't going to break your league. There might be some big development that doesn't make sense, but it's going to be one year's worth. And you'll see rookies come in, Justin Jefferson. You know in Madden 22, he's gonna be probably at least a 90 overall. Players make that leap in one year at times. It's usually only a couple a year, the ones that have the most production and win the awards. So I said I would take a look at the XP gain for this year and see if I felt like these numbers were too much and then make adjustments from there. And I have gotten some data now on probably around 20 players and I really like the development that we got for this year. So there might be some minor changes but overall we're going to have these boosted XP sliders because the main goal should be to allow players to become stars in a way that makes sense and allows your league to have high rated players that become high paid players that continue the cycle of having to draft, develop, sign and eventually lose players in free agency and teams haven't really been able to build through free agency in this series simply because there aren't enough players available. For the most part what happens is that a team gets a really good player, that player has his contract here and the team signs him. There are very few situations where a player's contract won't fit and the team doesn't sign him. The higher rated players you have, the higher the contracts, the more likely you are to have high paid, high rated free agents. That's what we're aiming for. So I want to show you the awards now and talk about specifically the rookies of the year because I love what happened there. Taquan Leighton ended up being the MVP. I love that for his story. He had a great year in Atlanta. Marcus Calhoun ended up being coach of the year again. Here are the awards though. Patrick Mahomes, Offensive Player of the Year. Boogie Turner, Defensive Player of the Year. Randall Cross, Offensive Rookie of the Year. And Marquise Cortez. Rookie of the year, inside linebacker for the Steelers, one of the biggest risers of the year. He was drafted at 71 overall and ended up as an 82. But he has superstar development. He was defensive rookie of the year and a pro bowler. So with his production and those two awards and his development, does a 10 point leap make sense? I believe it does. Prince Pendergraft. Highest rated player from the past draft, 83 overall. I have him here as an 87 overall. He wins plus four, he is an X factor. So in the case of Cortez, he came in as a 71. He needed less XP to develop, therefore he did at a faster rate. Pendergraft did not win any awards. His X factor development combined with like a nine sack season took him from 83 to 87. Keep in mind, linebacker XP, defensive end XP, different values, and finding the balance there is always critical. 
Ross Mastorovich was fourth. He was drafted at 77. He has star development and is now an 82. And uh, I have 82.4 because I was looking at their XP bars and roughly putting how far they were to their next upgrade as well. So he went plus five with star development. Maybe that's high, maybe not. But he was also somebody that racked up a lot of interceptions. And awards play a huge factor in this. So let's check out Marquise Cortez. Cortez went up 11 overall points because of Superstar Dev. I believe he had that all season long too. 111 tackles, 5 sacks, and of course the awards. That's where the big XP comes in. Pro Bowl, Defensive Rookie of the Year, especially together. Let's look at the progression history now. Just for Defensive Rookie of the Year alone, that's close to two upgrades worth of XP. For the Pro Bowl, 9,000, that's at least a point and a half. And obviously it goes up with every point, so I'm not sure how much he needed to get from like 78 to 79, but just roughly speaking, that's what happened. And I think that is a really good rise for a player. 100 tackles, that got goal experience. He was a focus train player because he was a rookie. So getting that year one development is really important, I think, to making sure your league has players that become stars and may eventually change teams. I want to give you a lot more examples because I'd like your feedback on if you think any of these outcomes are too high. So at quarterback, Randall Cross was Offensive Rookie of the Year in the AFC. 25 touchdowns, 6 interceptions. His overall went from 74 to 80. Ignore the 83. Morale is boosting it right now. So he's a true 80 overall player. A 6 point boost with star development. Playing all 16 games and becoming rookie of the year. Plus 6 makes a lot of sense to me. He was also a pro bowler. You could argue that's not enough development. But star dev has a different multiplier than the other developments. So at a point two, you have to say, okay, if he has star development, he can't go up 13 points or whatever because at Superstar or X-Factor, he'll go up 20. I think for star dev, this is pretty balanced. There was another quarterback here for Seattle, of course. There was Landon Laudermilk. I wanna say he was 76. I guess I never wrote this one down. But he went up to 83, ignore the plus one morale. X Factor took care of that development, obviously. And he was Offensive Rookie of the Year in the NFC. And he was also Player of the Week in Week 5. And that gives a nice XP boost. I think that makes sense for an X Factor quarterback. They also had a normal development undrafted quarterback or a late round pick quarterback in Matt Reddick, who went up two points. He barely played, normal dev, up two points. Sounds good to me. I want to talk about running backs now. Jim Jackson, he barely played this year, okay? He went from a 67 overall to a 71 at normal development, not really playing. That seems like it's too much. However, if you check the progression history on Jackson, you'll see that he has focus training. If he's a rookie getting focus training, he should get a boost. It was all season long. He got extra experience, so I'm cool with the plus four boost for him. Now, compared to a running back who actually played a lot, Jason Brothers went from a 79 to an 84 with superstar development. I think that also makes sense. He didn't have an amazing season or anything. He just got development because of that high uh, dev trait. He was probably a focus player, and a lot of these rookies were focus players they won't be next year so they'll develop at a little bit slower rate but i think that this is another example of development that i think works for me for the raiders i have dom pollard didn't play a ton he went from 75 to 79 plus four with his star development also focus trained i think this is kind of key that focus training will allow players to actually get high enough rated to play in year two, and then their play can carry them forward. I'm trying to think of how this all pieces together, and it's starting to make sense to me, I think.
Brian Watts for New Orleans, normal development, got to play when Alvin Kamara was injured for a long time, and he put up similar numbers to Jason Brothers, but normal development obviously has him developing a lot slower. So he goes from 73 to almost 77, also had some focus training. More examples here. Let's go Luke Irvin at quarterback. He didn't play. As a normal dev rookie, he went up two points. Same as Matt Reddick, who barely played. So, obviously, players that don't play aren't going to get a ton of development, but there is a little bit for rookies, and I think that is a good thing. So they can just get some development, maybe become high-rated to help the next season, and have a chance to play their way forward. Irvin also had focus training. Another example here, let's go to the Bears now. Alan Argento, he became one of the highest rated players at his position. And he did so going from 82 to 89 in one year. So Argento as an X Factor had a plus seven boost. I know it says 91 here, remember, take away morale. For Argento, let's see awards. Pro Bowler, two Defensive Player of the Week awards, and X-Factor. Plus seven in year one does make some sense. Ultimately, players need that path to becoming a high-rated superstar. You want to make sure it's the players that are playing like superstars and earning awards. So far, I haven't seen anything that I felt like it was way too much. Let's go to our team here, offensive linemen. We have Nick Lloyd at right tackle, 79 overall when I drafted him, and now he's 80 and a half. Again, take off the morale boost. So just one and a half points here at tackle, normal development. Did I have him as a focus player for much of the year? I believe I did. Maybe tackle's low. Some positions may still need extra experience. But I'm trying to find multiple examples before I go that route. So, James Church for the Raiders, number one pick. He is at star, and when he was drafted, he was a 77. He goes to 81.6. Now, obviously, linemen don't have any way of gaining development in-game, unless you edit them manually. So my fix for that has just been to try to boost their XP sliders and perhaps there's even more you can do there because realistically what is Church going to get to with Star Dev knowing that no awards is going to push his development? His ceiling is like 87. So maybe we have to upgrade the offensive line development even more so. I have some more players there for New England. We have a guard. Josiah Porter Benoit, 79 overall. He was drafted as a 76. Plus three here at normal dev is not bad, but I think in general, knowing how development works here, we probably should boost the O-line a little bit. We saw earlier Marquise Cortez had that gigantic leap, 10 points. Another Rookie of the Year winner in the NFC is Anthony Payne inside linebacker. 123 tackles, 3.5 sacks, and the interception. His rating now is 81. It started at 74. That's plus 7 with Star Dev winning at least one award. And he also went to the Pro Bowl and had a Player of the Week award. So that to me also makes sense. And if you're wondering if we get Pro Bowl experience when we make the Super Bowl and don't play in the Pro Bowl, we still do. Boogie Turner has been to five Pro Bowls now. So in week 17 here, or the wild card week, it shows. He does make the Pro Bowl, he's just not listed on that roster. Hope you're not tired of all these uh, numbers I'm throwing at you here. I'm just trying to show developments and get feedback. Sherrod Edwards, 687 yards, four touchdowns, focus player rookie with superstar dev. He goes from 78 to 83.8, I called it here. So that's a five point boost, almost six. I know that it's a lot for rookies, but you gain more experience your rookie year, really. It's the best opportunity especially for these teams that only really have rookies as focus players. 
I guess I can keep all these notes and try to see what happens then a year from now where their development goes and see what two years of progress looks like. But overall, after going through all those numbers, I'm really happy with that rookie development and it all made sense to me. None of those, I would say, were too much. If anything, the offensive line upgrades were just too small and I can take care of that. But what I will be doing is editing some contracts to make some more sense for our team. And you can let me know what your opinions are on what I should do here. What should the contract number for Boogie Turner be? What percentage of the cap should he be accounting for? And then we can do the same thing for some of the other high paid players on the team. We can look at Xavier Watts. I'm probably going to be close to doubling his contract. Maybe boosting Eric McKinney. Ultimately, I just want to make those contracts more realistic so we actually have to start caring about cap because when you have dominant players like Turner and we're going to look to sign Jamari Akinjide and we've already signed Eric Palmer, it's got to get tough eventually. It can't just stay fairly simple. So we're not going to wait for the game to create the difficulty. We'll just do it in a way that makes sense and does not cheapen the experience. Now the other thing I intend to do before our offseason is do a little bit of re-rating for anybody that isn't on our team. For instance, we look at the top quarterbacks here, should there only be four that are ranked in the 90s or above. Ultimately the XP sliders were too low for too long and now most of these players have just signed deals that end up being very team friendly so they can end up making easy decisions here with cap not always the case i think these numbers are pretty reasonable for like oliver raymond but if we go to like running back for instance let's go charquez towns who's like the best running back one of the best running backs to come out of any of our draft classes like a five million dollar cap number that's easy difficulty right there Keep in mind, that's the last year of his contract, too, so he was earlier in his career lower rated, making even less than that. So I want to do a little bit of re-rating here and make it uh, a bit more realistic, but I will not be editing any of our players in any positive way. As an example here, maybe I'll make Hayden Jean Charles a bit higher rated, and maybe I'll boost his contract a little bit to make up for that as well. I just want to make the series more realistic and more interesting. So I hope you like those ideas and please leave your feedback. I want to make a series that you enjoy watching and I want to make sure that even though we've won three rings in a row that there's still a lot of fun we can have here in the Broncos franchise. Now, I will be getting a Blackjack draft class again soon. We'll do a draft show just like last year and do the offseason the same way. Whenever he can get the class to me is when we will do that. I would like to do the offseason this weekend if I get the class by Saturday. I would be willing to do the offseason then Sunday. But I like to always keep these offseasons now on the weekends to accommodate for as many people as possible and do them early afternoon so all time zones can also uh, enjoy the show. So if we can do it this weekend, that's great. If it has to be pushed back a week, that's no big deal. We'll just uh, do something else in the meantime. And um, I think that's about all I got to say today. As far as the Callus Spell Mega episode that I'm working on. So right now, every game for year 15 is recorded. Some of them are edited, working on some others. And I know like obviously how it ends and everything so I know what players are going to be in the next draft class and uh, I'll be piecing that together now at a faster rate with everything recorded and the editing getting going here and then uh, hopefully getting you a really fun video I'm excited to put it together I think it's an interesting season to tell a story of and you won't be expecting like any of it anyway so it'll be exciting no matter what but that is it for today everybody Hope this video doesn't end up being an hour long, but we'll see what happens. Hope you enjoyed the video today and are excited for more action here in the Broncos franchise. Please leave a like. I'm looking forward to your feedback. And don't forget to subscribe for more on the way. Have a great day, everybody.